right now it's really a great joy to be able to introduce to you our friends, Pastor Bill and Connie McDonald. They have been serving the Lord uh, for over 25 years in the city of Cuenca in Ecuador. And uh, in that time, uh, the Lord has used them to establish uh, a, a thriving, faithful church of over 4,000 people. And uh, a blessing on top of that is that the Lord has used them out of that church to plant 50 daughter churches. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Amen. The McDonald's are really uh, a part of our Harvest Time family. Uh, our very first missions trip as a church was to be there with them in Cuenca, Ecuador in 1989. That's the very first. How many of you know, uh, how many, I'll ask for a show of hands, how many of you at Harvest Time have been, how many of you here in this service have been on a missions trip? How many of you have been? Look at that. That's quite a good number. Praise the Lord. Well, that was the beginning of it all. That was our very first missions trip, and it was a rough one. There are a couple of you that were there on it. Uh, I was teasing Skip Murphy that he went and he actually survived, but it was a close call. But since then, uh, we've gone on many missions trips, and that was a seed in many people's hearts to activate them into the work of missions and get them excited about missions and get them to get a heart for people who need to know the love of Jesus Christ. Um, the McDonald's uh, also uh, have been used of the Lord there uh, over the last few years to raise up a television station, which is now on satellite. It's called Uncion, which means anointing. And uh, what a great name for a TV station, right? What station are you watching tonight? I'm watching the anointing channel. That's pretty good. Praise the Lord. And uh, most recently, uh, we sent a team of people last year, I think in June of 2014, a number of our folks were down there ministering in Ecuador with Pastor Bill and Connie. And it's so great to have him here in person today, not just via Skype. I want you to stand to your feet. Please give your very best Harvest Time welcome for the McDonald's as they come to share. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> oh. you, no, don't sit down. That, that was too good. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> you do that for all the girls, don't you? Yeah. Let's do it one more time. Let's do it for Jesus this time. Lord, we praise you. You are the one worthy, Lord, of praise in your name. Amen. Oh, you may be seated. We have had so much fun. I know, I know you're thinking right now, oh, he has such a deep, raspy, sexy voice. Well, really, I just have a cold. That's it. Uh, uh, we've had so much fun. This is, a, this is an exciting place. My goodness, uh, you know, you go to some churches, they're just dead, and dead stuff after a while starts to stink. Well, y'all smell really good. Now, you may have to do it by faith, but tell the person next to you, you smell really good. <laughs> Daniela de Cuenca, como esta? Bienvenida. Como estas tú? Que lindo. Bon I, 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 are there any Ecuadorians here this morning? Hay alguien aquí que... Que habla español, pues. Que que bien, bienvenidos también. Daniela's de Cuenca, mi ciudad. Just stand up and greet the people. Welcome from Ecuador. She's living here nearby. And so glad, uh, so glad you're, you're here. And many friends that were with us on the missions trip and uh, last year. It's, it's really, really, really great to be here. And uh, here's, here's what's cool. In 1989, when we planted that church, yeah, in Cuenca, uh, you came down to help us. And from that date to now, you have supported us each and every month. You have helped us to maintain ourselves on the field, and we thank you for partnering with us, being part of our family. This walk of faith began as a, for me as a teenager. I followed a girl to church. I was raised Roman Catholic, and, uh, and I'd never... I'd, I, I followed this girl to a Pentecostal church, and I'd never been in a Pentecostal church in my life, and, uh, and, and, and she was a Baptist girl working the, the Pentecostal church nursery. The Pentecostal girls didn't want to miss church, so they hired the Baptist girls to work the nursery. And, uh, and she, although she was Baptist, she had never, never made a decision for Christ, and her mama said we were too young to date, but I could bring her home from work. 
So I went, I thought, you know, being a good Catholic, about 45 minutes, this thing should be over. So I come in at about 45 minutes into the service, and they were just getting going. And I sit in the very back in the corner near the door, and, uh, and the preacher started preaching on the second coming of Jesus, the rapture. I'd never heard it in my life. I'd never heard it. Scared the heaven right into me. And that preacher, he tricked me. I'll kid you. I don't know if I got saved or tricked, but he said, if you don't want to go to hell, raise your hand. I thought, if that is all you got to do to get it, I'm getting it right now. And I stuck my hand up. And then, you know, how, you know how they work you. You know how these preachers will work. You got to watch them. And he said, you that raised your hand. <laughs> I'm taking a lot of liberty since Pastor Glenn is gone this morning. <laughs> yeah. So you that raised your hand, just stand where you were seated. And, and so I, I thought, well, I'm near the door. I stood up. Next thing I know, I'm in front of all these people at the altar, for heaven's sakes, crying over my sins, receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And when I come to my senses, that little girl's in the nursery is kneeling next to me. Someone went back to the nursery and said, hey, that boy that's waiting on you out there just went forward to give his heart to Jesus. When she had always heard about it but never done it, she popped that baby over and took off for the altar, knelt there next to me, and that little girl is still kneeling next to me today, and that's my beautiful wife, Connie. I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell on you, baby. Yeah, is that, y'all ready for this? This is good. Uh, I began, we went to school in uh, Southeastern and graduated from Evangel University and went back to our home church to serve on staff there. And, uh, uh, but I have an itch inside of me that I cannot scratch. I was made for something else. And this is in Louisville, Kentucky, and, uh, uh, in, at our home church. And it, it's like, it wasn't that I was made for something better, but I was made for something else. You, 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 you might be there this morning. Why am I here? I understand that I love Jesus, that I'm saved, but what is the real purpose? And, and that's, that's where I was. Uh, and so I began to pray. And I'd go into our prayer room at the church before our staff uh, meetings every morning. And, and, and I would do what the scriptures call us to do, is to seek his face. Uh, and, and really, the, word, the idea of seeking his face, that's an interesting concept. It's to get in his face. That's what it means. I, I remember my daughter, Leah, when she was a little girl, uh, I remember how I could just turn her off. You know, she'd be wanting something, asking me questions. And I'd, you know, Daddy, I'm going to go play in the street. Okay, but take your little brother with you. You know, just, <laughs> you just don't pay attention to what you're saying. Well, she would get so frustrated with me. She's about five years old. She would grab me by both ears and pull her face to my face, and she'd say, I'm a talking to you. <laughs> and, and, and that's what I sense I was doing with God. I, I, not, not that he has a distraction issue, but I do. And it's like pulling my face to his face on a daily basis. And I say, I need, I need to look into your eyes, and I need to hear your heart beat. And I need to know what you want for my life. And maybe I'm speaking to someone this morning. Maybe you're still looking for why you're here. I promise you this. If you'll seek his face, I promise you this. He'll give you a reason to live. A real reason to live. He'll even give you a reason to die. And, and there was this huge map of the world in that prayer room. And my last prayer of the morning would be to lay my hands all over that map. I couldn't pronounce half the names of the countries. That's why it's good to speak in tongues. And so I just lay hands. And, and, and I, I go out the door. One morning, out of the blue, I mean, out of the blue, I feel like I needed to lay my hand on the country of Ecuador. I didn't speak Spanish outside of taco and enchilada. I, I didn't know how to. I thought Ecuador had a Q in it. it does, how many of you thought it had a Q in it? It does not have a Q in it. I didn't lose anything there, and I wasn't looking for anything there. But I placed my hand over that little country, and I prayed this prayer. Jesus, Luke 10. Two, Jesus just sent somebody. And I went out the door. Next morning, I go through the same scenario. Last prayers, lay hands all over that map. Well, Jesus just sent somebody. And I can't leave till I pray for Ecuador. And, and, and that's going on morning after morning. And this little postage stamp of a country on the west coast of South America is messing with me. 
and, and, and I can't figure it out. And I think I'm messing with myself. So I try to pray for other countries, but I, I just can't leave that prayer room until, until I pray. I can't even explain it. It's almost like you've had a good meal, but you, you don't need anything else, but you just want dessert. You know, it's that kind of a feeling. And, and I pray, lay my hand on there. So one morning after a number of months of this, I'm, I'm frustrated and, and I prayed this prayer. Jesus, what's the big deal about Ecuador? And the Lord answered me. And he answered me on the inside. I heard it so clear. He said, here's the big deal. I want you to answer your own prayer. And you know, there are some prayers you pray and there's some prayers you answer. And uh, you don't pray for your neighbor to have groceries or to someone share Christ with your neighbor. That's the one you answer. And I thought, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I just been called to be a missionary to Ecuador. It's just a, a moment in time. I mean, I tell you what, you start praying, it will mess you up. <laughs> and uh, so I don't go to the office, I go home to give this great revelation to my girlfriend who happens to be my wife. And uh, so I, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I did though date for a while a brunette. I was married to a brunette for a while. And then I was married to a redhead for a while as well. <laughs> Now I'm married to a blonde. <laughs> and as long as she's blonde, I'm sticking with the blonde. <laughs> so I go home to tell Connie this great news. And she wondered what I was doing home. And, and I said, listen, I heard from God today. Well, she's all excited. She goes, what did he say? I said, listen to this. You're not going to believe this. This morning, God called me to be a missionary to Ecuador. Now, young men, I've got a, this, 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 is, this is a commercial for you. When a woman, this will save your life. When a woman does this, watch me carefully. When she goes like that, see, see a little foot that comes out like that? I'm telling you, when she does that, here's your next move two steps backwards <laughs> she's coming after you son it'll save you a black eye well she does that and then she says this well who's gonna be your wife in Ecuador that's what she asked me <laughs> so I, I'm not you sit there baby you Baby, you're called to intercede and pray. I'm called to preach. So I dropped that and I prayed, Lord, call her or kill her. No, I did not pray. I did not. I did not. I'm, baby, I, am, I did not pray that prayer. I did not pray that prayer. I said, that wasn't even kind. I don't know why. I'm a... you, you know what, what she does? She, she, she'll go like this. And after service, she'll say, she won't get mad. She didn't get mad when I do this. Here's what she says. I need jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy you something, baby. Uh, anyway. <laughs> oh, no. This is not going to go. I really feel like I need to defend. No, baby, you don't. What do you think of me after all of this? I was That's good in the other story. services. Yeah, I was That's good in the other. That's his story yeah. and his side of it. Yeah, but listen to this. I dropped it. I really did drop it. I didn't talk about it anymore. But I just keep second, second. Call her or kill her? No, I did not pray this. You know better. You know I didn't do that, baby. You know. Uh, and so. Uh, okay, okay. okay. So she, uh, no, wait, 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 hang on. Man. She, uh, I, I dropped it and I just prayed. I said, Lord, if you can't call me, then you can call her. And if you don't call her, we're not going. And uh, one day, uh, we're in a, took a little trip up to Indiana. We go up to Indiana. And she uh, gave me a little box. And inside the box was a brass globe. And on the globe was a little note. And it said, I will go anywhere in the world with you. <laughs> okay, sit down. Sit down. 
Okay, I'll be heck, I'll be heck. All I can say is she gave me something with codeine in it this morning, and that's why I'm, I'm going to, at least that's what I'm going to blame it on today. We took off for Ecuador, went to Cuenca, city of a quarter of a million people, did a survey of the city, and there were not 800 baptized believers in a city of a quarter of a million people. And we, uh, we started church. We had 11 people our first Sunday. And uh, as Pastor Nick said, today that church runs over 4,000 people. And God's been good. God's been good. A television station. It's a Christian worldview television station. We do, uh, we do television. Uh, we do just television. We do news and sports and talk shows and uh, cooking shows and dramas. And, and, and it's become, uh, and we're, we're unashamedly Christians and we've become the number one local television station in that market of 500,000 people. Uh, I invite you to look us up. It's called, at uncion, U-N-S-I-O-N dot TV, U-N-S-I-O-N dot TV, and dot org is our, our donor site. Uh, and right now, uh, it's, it's just incredible, but of every hour of every day, on average, someone's coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior through this television station. So we thank God for that incredible, incredible tool. One of the things I love most about what I do is to disciple uh, new believers. And matter of fact, if it's not about discipleship, I'm just not interested. And, uh, and, and I love that part of it. And I was taking a, a group of brand new believers, just weeks old in Jesus, uh, in Ecuador, in Cuenca, in our home, through uh, a passage of Scripture found in Luke chapter 10. I invite you to turn there. Luke chapter 10, verse 2 uh, through 4. And we read through it two times, and I'll read, read it for you this morning. And it says, and this is from the New International Version, it says, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send out more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. And don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. So we read it through a couple of times, then I asked this question, is there anything that's, that jumps off the page to you? Is there anything that stands out and grabs your attention? And this one young man in his 20s sitting right next to me says, yeah, uh, that part about not greeting anyone. And I thought of all the things you could bring out of that text, and that's the one you pick? And he says this, sounds kind of rude to me. And I thought to myself, sounds kind of rude to me too. And then here comes the question. He says, well, what does that mean? And I'm telling you, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> I did not know. I, really, I never thought about it before. I never considered it before. And I have a degree in theology, but I did not have an answer. But I also have a master's degree in leadership. So I ask him, what do you think it means? See, that's good leadership. <laughs> so what do you think it means? And he says, well, I think it means don't get distracted. I said, you're right. <laughs> I've got a degree in theology, and you're right. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. That's good. And sure enough, that is, that is what Jesus is saying. Now, now, apparently, Jews really have a way to get distracted when they, they can spend all day just greeting somebody. Sort of get off track. And Jesus is saying, as you go towards your mission, as you live out this life of faith, don't get distracted. And boy, can we get distracted they, they tell us that 80% of all traffic accidents are due to distractions. Uh, it's the cell phone or the hamburger or whacking the kids in the back seat. You know, one of those things, they just get you distracted. And it just gets us off course and we forget uh, what we're doing. And even as a church, we find ourselves getting distracted. And we begin to think, Oh, it's about the worker. We have to have a missionary. We have to support the missionary. But you know what? It's really not about the worker. It's about the harvest. And it's not about the tools. Thank God for Uncion Television. But it's not about the tool. It's about the harvest. 
And it's not about the barn. And you're going to build a real pretty barn over there. Oh, my goodness. If Pastor Glenn hears me calling it a barn, he'll never have me back. But if it's harvest time, what is it if it's not a barn? <laughs> but guess what? It's not about the barn. Thank God for the barn. It's good to have a barn. But it's not about the barn. It's about the harvest. And guess what? It's not about the politics. We get distracted. And all of a sudden, because of things that are happening right now, we find ourselves, can I say it, hating people. It's not about the ideologies. It's about the harvest. And it's not about your right or my right. It's about the harvest. And see, it's not about you being comfortable in this building, and thank God we are. But it's more about the person that should be sitting right here in this seat. It's about the harvest. And may we not get distracted. A few years ago, I found myself just a little distracted. I discovered that I had uh, cancer, prostate cancer, and a very, very aggressive, the Gleason score was at the max, very aggressive cancer. And when Connie asked me in one of those very intimate moments, what do you think? And I said, I think I'm going to die. But because of And the prayers and the grace of God and wonderful medical attention, I stand before you this morning cancer-free. Cancer-free. <laughs> so as we say in the South, get her done. <laughs> well, but it shook me up. And uh, I went back to the New Testament. And I began to read the New Testament again as a pilgrim as a learner and i realized that there's a lot of stuff in that new testament we just don't do i'm like read it again read it again and there's a lot of stuff we do that's not in there and most of that is because of distractions matter of fact most of us never reach our god intended goals because we get distracted along the way. We lose sight of the goal. And let me say this. This church will do all that God has called this church to do if you don't get distracted. If we'll keep our focus on the harvest. Oh my goodness. We can fall into the politics of it into the arguments, in the rights, in the discussions, and miss the big picture. For you that like history, uh, the story of 1812 uh, is interesting to me. And of course, living up in this part of the world, uh, the War of 1812 uh, is very significant. And Star Spangled Banner just down the, the road here, and good stuff. Uh, but there was another war of 1812, and for you history buffs, knows it was the war, Russia's war of 1812, when the French invaded uh, Russia. And I will not do this story uh, justice at all, and please forgive me for uh, taking a very complex uh, war and, and boiling it down to just a couple of points. But uh, Napoleon left out of uh, Paris in, in June of 1812 with 680,000 troops, 680,000 troops, the largest French army ever assembled up to that point. And they marched towards Russia. When they crossed the border, the Russian army just lightly engaged them and fell back. And again, they engaged them, and again, the Russian army fell back, and Napoleon's army continued to march on. The Russians even war, won a skirmish, but they fell back. Now they were on the verge of marching onto Moscow, which was the prize. There, 
Napoleon would be able to sue the Tsar for peace and he would take control of Russia's future, which was his part of his plan to dominate Europe. But when he began to prepare for the battle for Moscow, the Russian army had already fled. And not only the army had pulled back, but all the citizens of Moscow had also left Moscow, leaving very few behind and leaving most of the city intact. So here comes Napoleon with his large army, marches into the heart of Moscow, and there's no one there to surrender to him. The czar is gone. The soldiers are gone. The inhabitants are gone. They've been living off the land. The soldiers are tired and they're hungry, and they begin to take up residence in the city. After a period of time, Napoleon says, we have nothing to win here. We've won it and we have nothing to win. We're going to have to go back to Paris. And they load it up. But in the process of loading up, they loaded up 40,000 carts of loot. They loaded up the bling of Moscow. It was just left behind. And they could not leave without the loot. I used to say the word booty, but you can't say that anymore. And they were loaded up, all of this loot, and they moved out of Moscow. But because they had these 40,000 carts of loot, they were slowed to a snail's pace. Then the Russian army began to pick them off one at a time, one at a time. And by the time Napoleon got back to Paris by the skin of his teeth, he had less than 80,000 troops. He started out with 680,000. Ended with less than 80,000. And it was the beginning of his demise as an emperor. And what happened was that instead of capturing Moscow, the bling of Moscow captured the French. Now, that sounds a lot like the church. God has placed us into the city, into the society, to win our society for Christ, to take a stand for the gospel. But I find ourselves becoming burdened with the loot of the world the good stuff of the world. And that's why the Hebrew writer says, don't let us not become so easily beset by the sin and the things, the things, just the good stuff. And I run into people day after day that said, I would go or I would give, but the stuff is holding me back. And it's the loot and it's the bling that robs us of the goal. See, listen, if the devil cannot destroy you, he will distract you. I want to show you a picture. I want to introduce you to my daughter. This is the Amazon of Ecuador, right there, right? That's my daughter right there. That's her right there. <laughs> That's the one that would grab me by both ears. Uh, and there, right next to her, that's my redneck son-in-law, right there. I have four grandbabies in there. I'm standing up here on the hill with the photographer. And my son, Seth, he's 23 years old. And they all live right out here. They, their house is just up the road here. And uh, this little road runs out right back over this way and into a Schwar village. And they're serving there among the Shuar and uh, have planted 100 churches among the 500 villages so far. And uh, my, 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 how much time, do, what time do we have to quit? I'm good? Okay. Y'all won't walk out on me. Um, my, my son, he's 23. He's a weird kid. He, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> she just said, no, he's got a weird dad. That's what she said. Um, uh, I, wanted, he, I wanted to buy him an extra pair of jeans. 
I said, Seth, let me buy you another pair of jeans. He goes, Dad, why, why do I need another pair of jeans? I have two pair of jeans. I said, oh, my gosh, this poor kid. And he uh, met a girl in Alabama. He, he wants to drag out there and uh, marry her, drag her out there. So uh, he was going to have last uh, Christmas, he, he uh, paid for her to fly to Ecuador to go out into the jungle, be sure she was going to work out, you know. And, uh, and so... Uh, they went back into a village, and, and oh, they, they love, when you have visitors, they love to, Daniela, now you, you, I'm telling, you, you have to tell the truth because you're sitting right there, and you're from my neighborhood, and uh, they, they will bring out this bucket of uh, big grub worms. You know the grub worms you have in your garden? Well, they're about the size of your thumb out there, and they, at, at, the, at the party or at the, the visitors come, they like to pass those out and eat them. They just love these grub worms, and you bite down on them, and they sort of explode in your mouth like a bazooka bubble gum, you know, or something. I don't know. It, I, now, I've never done this. I don't get it. I do not get it at all. But, but the, so the only way they'll explode in your mouth is if they're alive, and so they have these grub worms running around. So here's the big test, and so they pull them out, and they give this little, this little southern belle from Alabama. Here she gets it. Man, she, she pops that thing in her one of those eyes of love towards my son and pops that in her mouth and bites down on it and swallows down. And Seth says, I'm going to marry you, girl. <laughs> We're now officially engaged. <laughs> they live uh, out there. From this from that point right there, 150 miles straight out into the middle of the Amazon in Ecuador, there's a group of indigenous people called the Tatomanani. Tatomanani, there's only about 300 Tatomanani. Last missionaries attempted to uh, visit them in 1997. Um, they flew out to a little grass runway, these two missionaries. They stripped off all of their clothes because the Tatomanani lived without clothes. And they walked for two days to reach the Tatomanani. And once they reached the Tatomanani, the Tatomanani immediately martyred them. And no missionary has been back since 1997. Loggers have attempted to go in, and they were also killed on first contact. No one has ever survived first contact among the Tatomanani. Now, I know you, you think, are you kidding me? I know you would not believe that there's still groups of people that's even to hear in our own hemisphere, that's to hear the name of Jesus. It's a terrible thing that's going on because they believe in revenge killings. And a little boy will be raised all his life to murder the individual who killed his father. It's destroying them as a, as a people. They need the gospel. And more importantly than all, they need eternal life. My son came up with this crazy idea. He said, Dad, I'm thinking about taking soap into a village. I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. Why not? He said, uh, they don't have soap in these villages in the Amazon. And I know that sounds strange. Now, they, they have, they use sand or some kind of a root to wash with, but they don't have the antibiotics and deathly nothing that has uh, a scent or uh, that kind of uh, component. And he said, I want to see if it'll work. His first time out, he and my son-in-law, they put 30 pounds of soap on their back and they walked two days. And, and along that path, uh, two little kids came running out to see who these visitors were. And you have to be careful because uh, if they do not know you, they may decide to kill you before they invite you into the village. And uh, so... He immediately broke out a bar of soap and some water. He goes, hey, I've got something to give you. And he took his canteen and a bar of soap and leathered his hands up real good. 
and he washed the children's hands. He said, smell your hands. He said, uh, I like to give everyone in the village soap if you'll go ask them. And so they take off running to mom and dad. Mom, dad, smell my hands. You want some soap? This guy's going to give us soap. He said, yeah, bring him in, bring him in. He said, I, I stood there and I showed them all how to wash their hands carefully and use the antibiotics. And they tell us, the World Health Organization tells us that when you introduce soap to a community that does not have soap, you will save half of the children's lives. Isn't that amazing? And so they washed up with the soap, their hands. And then he says this, if you'll meet me tonight in the communal hut, I'll tell you about a soap that'll wash your soul and take your sins away. He said, Dad, everyone came back to the communal hut. He said, they smelled so good. <laughs> and he said, and when I asked him to receive the soap from heaven, the blood of Jesus, everyone in the village raised their hand and said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> they went back and they, they drilled a well, began to train a worker, a person of peace in that community. And they were invited to the next village back and then to the next village. And now week after week, they're going into new villages. And they push back past the, the Shwar, and now they're getting into the Akshwar area of Ecuador. And he said just the other day, he said, Dad, my next group are the Tarumanani. And, uh, and that concerns me. It, it's interesting, no, boy, if our kids, if your children have ever served in service, the military, you, uh, you stand, stand so proudly that they would go. And you wouldn't want to, we don't want to see our children suffer or die most of us would be so proud, though it hurts so deeply. And there are times I, I want to tell Seth, hey, how about working at Walmart, you know? <laughs> how about... But here's what I tell him. And, and I, I'm just being real transparent and honest with you. It, 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 it's not easy. It, it's, it, I don't like it. But I said, Seth, do one thing. You go and don't get distracted on your way. See, we will reach the title Manani if we don't get distracted. And we will make an impact in every one of these countries represented by these flags. We will make a huge impact if we don't get distracted. And this morning, what we're doing, we're taking these cards we're saying, see, no one's asking you to take money out of your, your food budget. How about we say no to some bling? That's all. Just say no to some bling. The bling of Moscow. Say, nope. No. And make a difference. For eternity's sake. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I, f I feel like I need to, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I feel like I need to deal with this for just a moment in a very personal way. I feel like I'm speaking to someone, somewhat prophetic, that you're a good person and you love Jesus, but the things of this world have slowed you down to the point that the enemy has you in his sights. And I don't say that to, to work you over or to criticize you. 
I've been there myself, even as a missionary. But they, today is the day to say no. Say no. And it may mean saying no to a relationship. It may be saying no to some possession. It may be saying no to some activity so that we can say yes to the goal, to the call. So Father, I pray that you will use Harvest Time Church to, to, do, to do and to be all that their name says. That it won't be a title on some pretty building but it will truly always be harvest time among us. And we'll be more concerned about that empty seat next to us than our own comfort and our own rights. And we'll be concerned about the one represented for this flag, by this flag. So do in us, Jesus, today just the thing you want to do. Do in me just the thing you so desire to do. In Jesus' name, amen.